And I have the privilege now to introduce our keynote lecturer, Dr. Justin Chi. I have worked with Dr. Chi almost every day for the past seven years. He's an incredible colleague. Uh, and he comes to dentistry uh, in a little bit of a different path than most of us. He started his career as a dental technician. He graduated from the LSU Dental Technology Program, which is absolutely one of the finest dental technology programs in the country. He, he uh, earned a CDT in uh, Crown and Bridge. And then, for some reason, he decided to go to dental school. And he, uh, he attended dental school at USC. And then he joined us here at Glidewell as the Director of Clinical Technologies. He's been incredibly important in our move toward digitization, in our move toward in-office milling. Many of you have taken courses with, with Dr. Chi. You know what a great teacher he is. And I'm just really, really excited to bring him on stage for you to talk about aesthetic dentistry restorative materials. So you got to watch this video run on loop for a while, so you got to good look at the two different types of materials. And I'm really living in this world for most of my aesthetic cases. These are both monolithic materials. Uh, Glidewell really revolutionized the industry back in 2009 when they introduced the first monolithic zirconia crown. And in just two years, it dethroned the PFM as the most prescribed restorative material for all situations. And I think many of you are benefiting from what zirconia and bruxer materials have. You can see on the left here, this is a class four ceramic. It's a aesthetic zirconia. This is our bruxer aesthetic, which I believe is the most advanced restorative material at the moment. Because of its extreme durability and combination of beauty as well. Lithium disilicate, this isn't meant to uh, be disparaging to this material because it is a beautiful material. It can be very strong. And as you saw Dr. Duplantis say, you, the strength really comes from bonding it. But on its own, you can see the difference. They behave very differently. One's much more durable. And you certainly want to have a more durable material for those situations where the patient has more parafunction, the patient has limited interocclusal space. Uh, so for those situations, it just adds that peace of mind to it. So this patient here, Stephanie, she comes in, chief complaint of very small teeth. She is very unhappy with her smile, very self-conscious with the size and shape of her teeth. And so I'll take you through the planning. So let's take a look at an overall view of the upper and lowers. You can see the alignment of her teeth. Maybe not ideal. I'll show you the arch form, form that we want to shoot for. And this patient, you can just see, you want to start off with a bigger picture, right? You can see that she has a lot of wear. She has some erosion. And so anytime you see this patient's 26 in her 20s, when there's a lot of signs of acid erosion, you want to have that discussion and kind of see what her habits are. You immediately start thinking maybe she's bulimic. She disclosed to me that on weekends when she parties, she would self-induce vomiting to improve on her discomfort. So it's important to kind of dive into those details and those personal habits of what could be contributing to it. I'm usually trying to be conservative in a restorative situation, but in her case, I want to help protect her teeth from further insult and acid attack. So she also had a lot of areas of interproximal decay. You can see some occlusal decay on the lowers. And so she's also overclosed. So in this situation, we're going to go through a full mouth rehab on her. But we first need to assess the existing position of her teeth, right? So let's take a look at these angles here. She's a class 2 diff 2. Centrals are pushed back lingually. We want to try to improve on the arch form and the positioning of the teeth. Great lectures this morning that dove into the details and, and the parameters that we're trying to shoot for, the guidelines on improving the aesthetics. Let's take a look at the arch form here. And what I'm always trying to shoot for is to improve on the existing arch form, if there are teeth out of alignment. And this can also decide for us or dictate whether or not we need to perhaps go through an orthodontic situation, improving on the alignment of the teeth. 
because whether you're doing full coverage or partial coverage, we want to try to be as conservative as possible with our preparation approach. You can see here, based on this occlusal view of the upper, uh, number 10 is a little bit out of that arch form alignment. And since eight and nine are pushed back, that's gonna dictate how much we're gonna prepare, especially on the facial, of those restorations. So maybe a little bit more preparation on, on 10, a little less on the facial of eight and nine. Now we wanna use this frontal view to help guide on the changes. So I define what areas I like about the patient's existing teeth. So starting at the midline, so I'm looking at, is it centered on the patient's face? You saw Dr. Swanson talk about parallelism and how important the cant is. We wanna avoid the cant in the patient's smile, but in this case, her midline's actually set up in a good angle and position. And I'm also looking at gingival levels. We have to consider the gingival zeniths of each of the teeth as well. Yes, she has short teeth, but are we just gonna lengthen all of the teeth? No, you can't do that. And I used to take approach, an approach where I'm shooting for all centrals around 11 to 12 millimeters, but that can't apply to every situation. And I'll show you what I use now. From that point, then I define what areas I do want to improve on, what areas of the gingival, gingival, gingival zenus I want to lengthen, what areas of the incisal edges or occlusal plane I want to lengthen as well. Now, this is a very important view here, the resting position. Where are the incisal edges? How much incisal display at the centrals in this resting position? And there are some guidelines to this. Uh, Dr. Swanson also dove into this earlier. And these studies look at females versus males, the amount of display. Females, you want to have a little bit more display. You saw the average earlier was around 3.5 millimeters. With males, it's around one to two. I just find having at least a little display is much better than too little or too much. If the teeth are really into the lower lip, then perhaps you just keep that same level. So in this case, she has about one and a half millimeters of display, but they're also pushed lingually. So taking all of this into account, you can decide if you're gonna bring the incisal length longer or keep it the same, or maybe shorten them as you saw Dr. Barrett show in one of his cases. So I like to perform my own wax ups. So I have a diagnostic model of the patient, just the maxillary here, and I apply wax directly to where I want to improve on the aesthetics. So you can see changing the gingival zenith positions, lengthening or really just bringing the facial surfaces of eight and nine forward, lengthening seven and 10, and just bringing it back into that uh, posterior region so it's a smooth transition. Defining the, the right symmetry and then creating the right arch form. Once you can create that diagnostic model, the diagnostic wax up, then you wanna be able to try to transfer that and visualize it on the patient. So I'm using a putty matrix. This is a capture impression material. You just mix the base and catalyst together and create your own putty matrix. It's basically an inverse of your diagnostic wax up. If you don't do your own wax ups, which I'm sure many of you don't, the lab has an incredible process, a diagnostic wax up department that can do this for you but it is important to guide them on if you are planning to lengthen the teeth gingivally as well, because they're only gonna start where the existing gingival positions are. So you have to consider that for these aesthetic cases, and you can see they make a really nice putty matrix for you as well. So we want to trial the smile on the patient. So in the putty matrix, we seat bisacral material, let it set up, and we can evaluate the patient's smile, have them open a little bit, get an actual genuine laugh out of them so you can see that smile curvature or all of those guidelines that you applied within the diagnostic wax up, does it transfer into this putty matrix and preview for yourself and the patient? And you can get that buy-in from the patient to ensure that you're going and moving in the right direction. It's all about that predictability. From here, if everything checks off, 
And you certainly can modify this as well if you change the incisal edges, change the facial planes. If you do make those changes, you can relay that back to the lab and say these are the modifications I want. And then since we're gonna do a full mouth rehab, full contour restorations for her, we're gonna create some provisional shells. So you need to know how you're gonna provisionalize it while the final restorations are being made. So these are biotemp provisional shells made by the lab entirely based off the wax up. So we use intraoral scans here. So we can use an intraoral scanner, can take the scans, that impression, send it to the lab, and they'll be able to mimic all of those contours, all of those incisal edges and contacts exactly the way you have it in the wax up. The lab will create a clear stent based on that wax up that helps guide the placement of the biotemps, but it also serves as a gingival, uh, gingival laser or a gingival surgery template for the gingivectomies. So here I'm using a YSGG laser from BioLase. This is their I plus laser. I'm just going all along the gingival contours of this template. So again, this template will serve as a seeding guide for the template, or excuse me, for the biotemps. But here you can see I'm just going all along the areas that I want to lengthen and crown lengthen the teeth. You can see it's very, very easy to just fillet off the excess gingival contours to establish the right gingival zenus along from four through 13. You can see I'm using both hands. I like to stabilize the removal of the soft tissue. And you wanna to try to angle that from apical to incisal in that direction. And I used to use a superficial setting, but now you just go right into it to the depth of the tooth structure. Now for the preparation. You're wanting to use a, in this case, I'm using a large round end tapered diamond. I'm shooting for a chamfered margin. You want your internal, round, internal line angles to be rounded. So I suggest a round ended diamond or a modified shoulder approach, which is a shoulder margin, but it's a rounded internal line angle, which is very, very important. So here in this situation, you can see on eight and nine, because the incisal areas are pushed back to the lingual, I'm applying just a minimal reduction at that gingival margin. I shoot for about half a millimeter of reduction. So it's really, really important that your preparation is adapted based off of that end approach. Like what you've heard this morning, starting with the end in mind is extremely critical for these aesthetic cases that allows us to be much more conservative in our tooth reduction. So following along, I actually prepare from 6 through 11 first on just the facial surfaces. I'm not even going through the contacts or the lingual yet because the facial is going to be the most important and critical area. So I just apply the preparation, apply the burr right in that area, right along that zone to establish a sharp cable surface finish line because that's what the lab is going to use to find and define the transition point of your restoration to the tooth structure. A smaller diameter burr, this is an 856-018. It's a round ended tapered diamond, applying it in her proximally. And I'll show you a veneer case afterwards where in these situations where you're wanting the emergence profile to help close spaces, you want to define and move that margin a little bit more lingual to allow for the right emergence profile. So you can see here that smaller diameter round into tapered burr going in approximately to define and open up those contacts. Another really important aspect to your preparation is if your margins in approximately are right up against each other, you want to establish closer to half a millimeter of separation between the teeth. If they're right up against each other, you can use a needle burr, a small diameter burr to create that separation that's gonna improve the chances of you capturing that margin properly for the lab to fabricate the restorations. So now you can see we're taking those provisional shells. You wanna seat these shells on first because we tend to under-reduce these preparations. So try it on and check for any interferences. You may need to modify the internal 
of these shells or reduce a little bit more in your preparation to allow them to seat properly. And that's one of the benefits of that seating guide. That clear stent template will allow you to know if it really is going down where you need it to be. So slowly seating that template on. You can see we apply a little bit of bonding agent internally. We cure that. This is a, a bisacryl material that we apply internally. It takes about a couple minutes to set up. And then you just refine the excess. You want to ensure that those margins are clear and visible for the trimming and removal of the excess material. And so I'm not going to take you through the preps of the lingual. So I finished 6 through 11, continue on and prep the posteriors. And then now the anterior provisionals serve as the seating and stopping guide for those posteriors. And so we reline these the same way with our Luxatemp bisacryl material. So just to give you an idea of the uh, materials that we use for the provisionals, uh, a bonding agent internally to cure and, and help ho hold the reline material, and then a couple of diamond finishing burrs. White stones work really great as well to remove the uh, excess buildup, excuse me, not buildup, the excess reline material. And then we bond that in. Here we're using Kerr Temp Bond Clear to lock those provisionals on. So once the provisionals are done, you can see you want to make sure that they're really, really well adapted to the preparations. Now, we don't take the final impression on the day of the prep. We have the patient come back a week later, and when the patient returns, we don't remove the provisionals just yet because we want, to, we want the provisionals to serve as the template for the final designs. So what we do is we first take a scan we call it a preoperative or pretreatment scan of the patient, of the upper teeth, of the lowers. You establish the bite. We are opening her bite about three millimeters, one and a half on each arch. And the scanners, the intraoral scanners, will, will capture all of those ideal contours and all of those ideal occlusal surfaces for the finals. Once the scans are taken of the provisionals, then we can move on and take off the provisionals and begin our final impression procedure. So here we're using our crown forceps. We're going to wiggle off those provisionals. You can see just a week later, there's still a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of bleeding. We want to clean off those preps as best as possible. So here we're using pumice. Uh, pumice is an abrasive, so make sure that you're not running this too high or with too much pressure. Uh, on a bridge prep that we've done, my assistant uh, actually caused a pulp exposure from pumicing the preparation. So you don't want to go at too high of a rate. Uh, it can remove tooth structure. So be very, very careful. Now, once the preparations are clean, we want to displace the soft tissue. And this is a step that I know many dentists dislike, packing cord. But it is so important that we need to expose those margins. So here we're using a size one cord on all the anteriors. And on the posteriors, we use a size two. Uh, this is to, again, push the tissue out laterally. We want to create a space along or between the soft tissue and that hard tissue. So what we do is we remove the cord. It's just one large cord that's packed in. We remove the cord from number two to number six. And we can scan. So here you can see we're using the Itero Element Scanner. You scan along the occlusal. It's a dynamic process, occlusal, papua, and lingual. And instead of removing the core and all the preps together, we only do one quadrant at a time. And we're focused there, we evaluate the scan, we determine can we visualize all of our margins, do we have great retraction, do we have the parallelism and lack of undercuts or reduction of undercuts that we want in our prep. Once that quadrant is scanned in well, then we can move on to the rest of the anteriors. So then we continue on and take off the rest of the cords just in that anterior zone from 6 through 11. And then we go ahead and apply our scan here as well. Once we evaluate the scans here in the anterior, then we continue on to the upper left quadrant. We continue taking off the cords. And once you take the cords out, you want to make sure that there's no bleeding. You get that under control. That's really, really important. And then you want to air dry the site. A dry site, dry tooth preparations, any fluids down in the sulcus, you want to clear all of that out 
to ensure that you can capture a really clean, clear margin and certainly it improves on that accuracy, whether you're scanning or taking a conventional impression. So here you can see we're just sweeping along again and capturing that whole occlusal surface. That's usually the foundation of all intraoral scans, occlusal, buccal, lingual. Once those scans are captured, you want to evaluate the scans. Don't just go ahead and submit it to the lab. And one of the advantages of having a scanner is you can visualize your work immediately. So here we, we have the fast design software, and I'll show you how we create our designs for this case. But using, if you were simulating the evaluation of your scans on the scanner itself, I recommend changing the color or turning off the color of that scanner and viewing your preps in stone. This is the step we take, whether it's a single unit preparation or a full mouth case, as you can see. We just go one by one, evaluating, rotating. Can we visualize the preps? Can we visualize the margins the way that we need? Once the scans are done, we submit this to our design station. This is our fast design software. And it actually has artificial intelligence that will identify where the margins are on each prep, which you can certainly modify even further. If you're in my workshop tomorrow, we're gonna to go through this process together. You can see once the margins are set, the software uses a design algorithm, a margin, excuse me, a crown AI. It's a design artificial intelligence that analyzes the situation and it uses the collective knowledge of millions of restorations to create this incredible design proposal. Now you can see here, I activate the template of that provisional, right? So the great model that you're visualizing is the provisional, and that serves as a guide for the final designs. So the areas that you see in gray are the provisionals extending beyond the design, because I felt those areas were slightly over contoured, so I can bring the design more lingual. The areas of white that you see beyond the gray, that is the design that I thought was under contoured, or where the provisionals were under contoured. So you can modify and adapt your designs based on what you're visualizing on the patient with the temporaries. Right? The test drive, the provisionals really, really serve as a very important step through this restorative process. Once the designs are done, I'm actually using the most advanced and sophisticated method to fabricate zirconia crowns right in your office. This is the fast mill. It's a completely electric mill that will mill zirconia in a fully centered form. So it takes about 30 to 35 minutes to fabricate Bruxer Aesthetic and Bruxer Full Strength, Bruxer Now materials right in your office. And so you can see here, these are actually the lowers. So I use Bruxer Aesthetic on premolar, premolar, both the uppers and lowers. And then you can see the molars here in Bruxer now. And what's amazing about this is the material is in its final form. The formulation is exactly what you get from the lab. All you need to do is remove the sprue, you separate the restoration from the sprue, and then you would finish that off with either a diamond, a fine grit diamond, or a stone. And then now we can move on and prepare this to deliver on the patient. So now the patient's back for the delivery. The total milling time is about eight hours for uh, just the upper restorations. But that mill is a workhorse. Once it finishes one, we just drop the next one in. It's a good reason to have a couple mills if you plan on doing multiple unit cases. But here you can see we pumice the preparations again. And then now we're going to go ahead and seat everything on. The, the wonderful thing about digital designs are you can define exactly what you want your contacts to be. Again, the margins are right on the money, assuming that you follow the right clinical protocols to retract the tissue and establish a nice finish line in your prep. And we just try them on one by one. As I'm seeing the restorations down, especially with multiple units, you want to ensure that one restoration's heavier contact does not affect the next restoration is real easy to cause this negative chain reaction. So you really want to ensure that those contacts fit passively. Ideally, we normally do two at a time, making sure that the contacts between them are not too heavy, which could result in some push against that neighboring tooth. Once all the restorations are, 
are checked, we check the margins, we check the contacts, then we can move on with our bonding protocol. So all of our restorations, we seat them on with a try-in paste that's water-soluble, but if you're going to bonds or clone your restorations in, especially chair-side restorations, you need to air abrade that material. So here I'm using the chair-side Danville air abrasion unit with 50 micron aluminum oxide. What that does is it roughens the internal surface. We can't etch zirconia the way that we etch glass ceramics with a porcelain etch or hydrofluoric acid. This air abrasion is what provides that internal roughness. It's also going to remove any salivary phosphates that can inhibit the bonding, which Dr. Bender will speak to uh, later today. Once the internal aspects have been air abraded and cleaned out properly, with zirconia, we want to apply a phosphate primer. So this is Monobond Plus by Ivoclar. There's a few other options in the market, like Z-Prime by Visco. And then now the restorations are ready to bond in. So now once the restoration is set aside on the preparations, now we're going to treat the teeth. Uh, I like using a desensitizing agent. This is Gluma. I'm using this bristle brush. You want to make sure you keep that away from the soft tissue. It can be a soft tissue irritant. Uh, so a light application, letting it sit on the preparations for one or two minutes, and then we just aspirate any excess. Once we're finished applying our desensitizer, then we're going to apply our bonding agent. So we're using Kerr Occubon Universal. You want to make sure you scrub that in complete coverage on the preparations from inside the wish down to the margins. And then the resin cement that we're using here is Kerr NX3. And for my anterior cases, I really like using the light cure variety because that way you have a little bit more working time, essentially unlimited working time. So that way I can see all the restorations down simultaneously. Question. Yes. So this is the cornea, but the light goes to the Yes, it does. Good question. So the question was, does light pass through the zirconia? All of our existing zirconia restorations have a good level of translucency to them. So the light does pass through. And so you can see here, that once the restorations are seated, I like to use these bite sticks to help stabilize and seat, fully seat the restorations down. And then now we're using a small diameter light cure to fully cure the middle of each restoration. That way it stabilizes the restoration. And then whatever your preferred method of cleanup is, if you want to tack cure and soften and accelerate the cure, get it to a gel state, you can easily peel it off. Or if you'd like to remove it while it's in its uh, more runny state, you can do that as well. Now these interproximal finish finishing strips or serrated finishers Extremely important, especially if you are bonding, these resin cements, once they cure, can become extremely hard. So that is a quick strip, serrated finisher. I find it's very nice and stable to get through those interproximal regions. Now, of course, we want to check, check the bite, one of the most accurate things we do in dentistry. Uh, when we check it immediately afterwards, we make our modifications, but on a big case like this, I have the patient come back after a couple of days uh, to verify, again, because the muscles have, the patient's been open for so long. We want to allow that area to settle, the muscles to settle. And so that's my approach there. I do the uppers. I'm not going to take you to the lowers, but we basically repeat the same exact thing on the lowers. And you can see the before and after of this patient's dentition. We were able to improve upon the arch form. We saw that improvement earlier. And the beautiful thing is these are not staining glaze. Again, this is right out of the mill. So here are the lower restorations, and we call this uh, bleach floor. It's about an OM3, OM2 color. And you can see the before case, or before situation, and then the transformation for our patient, uh, both, both upper and lower full coverage restorations. Just a couple of views here. You can see by planning not really lengthening the teeth a lot more. We're bringing the teeth, bringing the soft tissue upwards and improving on the difference and establishing those proportions, those laterals a little bit higher the way that uh, Dr. Swanson kind of mentioned this morning. It's always nice to see the full face and how it transforms the patient. 
And so I think it is really important, if you're gonna do more of these aesthetic cases, start looking at a lot of smiles. Even patients that you're not gonna to touch the anterior, start observing, see which uh, smiles stand out to you. How do they compare? Golden proportions and these guides are great, but find what works best for you. As a dentist, I think that uh, being able to tap into that creative and artistic side and visualizing where you want to bring the case uh, will allow you to really help transform lives for your patients. In another view here, you can see this resting view. This is always what I look at at the final, trying to determine. Initially, I thought that maybe I'd made it too long by bringing the facials forward. You can see there's still great display, not excessive, uh, right around that three and a half to four millimeters of that average and size of view. All right, next case. Yes. Yes. Not here, but I'll show you later. <laughs> so this patient here, this is our patient Renee. You can see a closer look here. Uh, she didn't like her spaces. She didn't like the peg laterals. And she was also missing number 12. And so we're going to try to take a conservative approach here. We're always trying to minimize the amount of tooth removal. And you can see you want to define the areas, that starting position, and again, the smile view. Again, defining what areas do we like. Her midline is in the middle, a little bit of a space, but we're going to try and close these spaces with an additive approach uh, with conservative veneers. You can see the soft tissue outlines here, especially on seven and eight. These areas could use a little bit of improvement. And always factoring in that resting position. And this is really, really important. And also that facial plane. How does it match and align with the frontal plane of the patient? And so the lab fabricates this wax up that defines the uh, plan improvements that we want. Again, you have to guide the lab. If you are utilizing the lab for this diagnostic approach, they don't know if you're going to want to crown lengthen or gingivectomy the patient. So you can see this is our putty matrix. You can see the scalloping along the margins, the gingival margins. It allows for the excess bisacral material. Once it's set, it's easily removed. So you can poke that away, and it's a real clean adaptation along the margin. And so because we're in a crown Nathan, especially just along 8 and 9, and between 12 and 13, or 12 is missing, 11 and 13, we're going to use the template. We're going to use this um, mock-up on the patient to guide the soft tissue contouring with our laser. And you can see you want to try to seat the uh, putty matrix as so slowly as possible to help minimize these bubbles, but I'm not as good as Dr. Barrett. His came off really, really cleanly, but you can see we have a repair material uh, that we apply, and I like to use a an explorer to just kind of flow on and shape the areas that need to be filled in. And the reason why I want to adapt and define the areas as best as possible is because we're going to use a similar approach as the last case where we want this, this mock-up on the patient to guide the design. So we're going to scan this in once we can fill in the voids on this, uh, on this mock-up. So you can see, using the, the uh, Explorer, we're going to light cure that into position and just checking that. And once again, uh, we're going to use our intraoral scanner. In this case, once again, the iteral element. Now our cases, we're using the fast scan from powered by Meta. It's a global fast scan, but it works exactly the same way. You're going to scan the preoperative or pretreatment situation. We start occlusal and sizal, and as you rotate lingual, and facial, you can fill all the contours, and it's basically just filling in all the missing pieces of the upper and lower teeth. Now, once this area is, once these areas are scanned in, then we begin our preparation. So I'm just refining the excess along those gingival margins. So this is a, a long needle diamond that I just take along those gingival margins. Uh, here, now I'm beginning the process of the gingivectomy. So, once again, it's the I plus laser from BioLase. And so this is a different approach, right? You have the mock-up in place, and that can guide your removal or soft tissue removal. And then 
The other approach that you saw earlier is to use the template, the smile template or the seating template with those provisional restorations. So it's real easy to do. I also, like Dr. Duplan, start my preparations from the incisal. Now this mock-up on the tee serves as a prep guide. So we can create our depth cuts through the prep guide. And this is a really nice approach for these partial coverage restorations to be conservative. If you don't have the mock-up in place, you might over prep certain areas. Because this is more of an additive approach, uh, we can define the amount of material that we want. For this case, we are planning a lithium silicate veneer for all of these restorations. So your preparation technique needs to be very minimal. But to create the optimal contours in that final design, you basically have to remove areas on the facial, the gingival margins, the incisal edge, and a critical area is going to be interproximally. You need to make sure that you're reducing that interproximally. That will allow the lab to establish the right interproximal embrasures and thickness for these restorations. And we'll talk a little bit about breaking the contact on these veneers uh, once we get through the depth cuts here. So here you can see I'm using a round and tapered diamond. The diameter at the tip is about one millimeter, but I'm shooting for about half a millimeter of reduction, a nice step, a nice finish line along that gingival margin. Now with veneers, it does get tricky because one of the goals is to hide the transition of that ceramic restoration and the tooth. So any areas that are visible, you basically want to bring that margin in approximately far enough to hide that transition point. Another really important thing when I'm prepping veneers is I'm trying to define the path of insertion. How are you going to seat these restorations onto the prep? It's going to help the lab as well fabricate these restorations for you. Now, all of my veneer preparations have a somewhat flattened size of edge. I don't wrap around. When you wrap around with veneers, you run the risk of having a really thin layer of ceramic on the lingual. And then once you wrap around, the path of insertion entirely changes for that restoration. And there's a greater risk of undercuts, especially in the interproximal region. So I always have a slightly more flat incisal edge. That lingual margin or that incisal margin is going to terminate at that lingual incisal junction. It's basically the butt margin at that incisal lingual junction. So here, once the depth cuts have been established, or they've been established, so I use a large round and tapered diamond and just blend everything in. Uh, you can use a pencil to mark as well through the depth cuts and basically blend everything in until you've reached that marking point. But I've done this several times that I know exactly where I need to reduce the excess material, the excess tooth structure. Now you can see the depth cuts that I made were from the margin up to the incisal edge. I prefer that method. I know there's reduction burrs, those Christmas tree burrs, but I find that can potentially over prep so I like to reduce the preparation from incisal edge or gingival margin to the incisal edge and slightly follow the contour of that facial surface because it's not flat. It will have typically a three-plane surface or contour in that anterior zone. So this is a 856-025. It's a round end tapered diamond, large diameter. The 025 indicates a 2.5 millimeter diameter at the largest point near the shank. I prefer these tapered diamonds because it's less likely to create a, a undercut on the preparation. You can more stabilize and keep your burr following the long axis of the tooth. Now in approximately switching to a smaller diameter burr, still a round and tapered diamond. Anytime there are spaces and you're wanting to close those with veneers, it is important to bring that preparation in approximately so that the lab, or if you're designing these yourself, the contours can, can be established properly. If you don't bring the margins and the prep far enough to the lingual, then the contours tend to be incorrect. And it's real easy to have insufficient material and the contours, again, just may not adapt correctly. So you want the margins in approximately go further back. 
So these are just some of the burrs that I like to use for full coverage, for partial coverage, anterior, posterior. There's always a smaller uh, needle nose or needle diamond to create that separation. I'm going to show you the uh, finished preparations here. We do pack four. This is a size one four through all of the anterior, through all the preparations, and they're all connected. Now uh, you want to make sure you bring the cord far enough to the lingual. Can you go back to the picture for the birds? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Now these bird numbers are brassler, but uh, I'm all about the shape. So it's all a round end taper diamond that helps establish that rounded internal line angle at that gingival margin. It's really, really important. And then once you've reduced the incisal and the interproximal axial surfaces, you want those internal line angles to be rounded as well. Because most of these materials, they're going to adapt much, much better to rounded internal line angles. And if they're machined, they are going to be much easier for these systems to fabricate two rounded internal line angles. So you can see just one single cord. It helps displace the tissue. Uh, I bring the margins typically for these veneers just equigingival. You can see that displacement apically with this single cord, and then we're going to remove the cord for our final impression, which will be a digital scan. Now, as far as breaking the contact, here you can see I did not. Let's see if this works. You can see in these zones here. There was no pathology. There's what, there were no interproximal carries or existing restorations. So I don't break the contact or, or break it in a traditional sense where it's wide open, but I do use a finishing strip, a diamond finishing strip to help create minimal separation. It's gonna be much, much easier for the lab or if you're gonna make these restorations on your own to adapt with some slight separation. When the margins are right up against each other, it's extremely hard for the lab to make the proper contours. So I normally bring these zones, if you don't have to break the contact entirely, at least midway from facial to lingual. That's gonna allow for the right facial contours. It's gonna allow for the proper embrasure formation that creates that individualized appearance with these restorations. Now, where there's more of a space in the diastema, bringing those margins more to the lingual just about where that lingual interproximal junction is, is going to be really important. That will allow the ceramic to build and create that beautiful emergence profile that you want. So here we're removing the cord very, very slowly, and we're going to take our impression. Again, we took a scan of the mock-up on the patient, and then now we're going to merge that with our scan of the preps. So along the incisal edge, we're building that entire preparation model. Veneers are a little bit more challenging to scan with an intraoral scanner because you have these vertical areas of the margins. So you really need to make sure that you're rotating and positioning the head of that scanner in the right directions, in the right angles, and make sure that it's building properly. So it's always very critical to evaluate your digital model after it's been generated. You can see we're positioning on the lingual, and as we're on the lingual, instead of keeping it straight along the lingual, you want to rotate that camera head left and right so that the light source on the scanner comes into contact with the two structure. So you can see here between 9 and 10, it's a little bit open, so we do actually want to go back and fill that in. These are just some of the tools that we like to use. Now, I always have viscous stat nearby. Especially even after you pull the cord, you want to use a hemostatic agent. Now, if that doesn't work, below viscous that is a stringent in X. That's uh, Ultradent's strongest hemostatic agent. That does an amazing job for heavy, heavy bleeding situations. You need to control the bleeding before your impression is taken. Now, I do like the Premier Knit Pack cord a little bit more than the others, and that's what we use in this situation, and that's the Fisher's. Uh, ultra bags that we use to seat the cord down. And if you haven't seen it yet, if you're looking at an intraoral scanner, you're all going to be scanning at some point, I guarantee you. You need to take a look at this fast scan. Uh, it's an amazing adjunct to what we do. Definitely improving on the work and quality of your dentistry because you can visualize your work immediately. Now, 
Now we're going to provisionalize this. I know there's often questions on provisionalizing veneers. So here I seat or replace a desensitizer again. And then now I've placed a bonding agent. Notice I'm placing it on the facial and incisal. This is going to help lock that provisional in place. We're going to do a, use a shrink wrap technique. I cure the bonding agent because I don't want the bonding agent to move when we go to seat the Bisacro with the putty matrix. Once it's cured, now we're going to load that putty matrix with our uh, Bisacro Luxatent material. Making sure the side is ready. And now we're going to slowly seat that into position. Try to minimize any inclusion of the bubbles. And because of the scalloping along the gingival margins, the excess material, once that sets up, Notice I'm actually lightly tapping along the edge of the putty matrix. What that does is as the material is hardening and setting up, that helps cut the excess. But you don't want to push too hard because you can very easily thin the material. So just really, really light, just slices along the gingival margin, and then you can easily remove the excess uh, with an explorer or, or a scaler. Now the excess material will set before the inside, so we usually give it another 30 seconds to, to harden, and you want to break the seal, push the body matrix forward, break the seal, and then slowly remove it, and damn, we still have some voids. So we're just going to fix those areas. Uh, now we have our build-up material, again, our repair material, in those same spots. So, we just add the uh, material to the inside of edges to the voice directly and just shaping it with our uh, Explorer. The Explorer is kind of my go-to. Uh, even with direct composites, I like to use flowable, using the Explorer, agitating the, uh, the flowable material into position. It just helps push it and, and flows and adapts to the preparation really, really nicely. So a little bit more between uh, 9 and 10. And then once those areas are adapted, we get that cured and set. So now, the restorations are made. We're going to take off the provisionals. This is probably the worst part of this process, is taking off these bonded uh, provisionals. So I actually didn't etch. I didn't spot etch the area. I'm trying to minimize the amount of bond to the preparation. And these hold on really, really well. I used to just put it mid-facial, the bonding agent, but then the incisal would break off. So then that's when I started adding a little bit of bonding agent at the incisal, especially if you're going to have the patient wear these for a while. All right, it helps hold these in place. So now we're making some slots through the provisionals, and we're going to use a separator. Uh, this is from Hugh Freedy. You're going to see we're going to break off the excess. I usually try to separate it, and, and this is why I don't want bonding agent getting near the margins, because I don't want to touch the margins at all during the seating and the delivery. It's a little bit okay to uh, have some slight tooth structure, removal, mid-facial, and uh, we can adapt that and that'll fill in, but I don't want to have to touch uh, that marginal area. It does also help to turn off the water. That way you can visualize it. These build up or bisacryl acrylic materials, they blend so well. The materials that we use, even as a provisional, blend so well to the tooth structure. So turning off the water does sometimes help visualize uh, that delineation between the hard tissue and the provisional. Once things are off, we're going to go through and you see I'm going to now blend in my uh, Removal grooves with a fine grit diamond. I do also use this to help remove any of that excess bonding agent that's still remaining on the tooth structure. Uh, you can do this with a fine grit diamond, or I'll use a carbide burr, a slow speed carbide, and just lightly, lightly touch uh, the preparations to remove that bonding agent that was cured in place. So we're pretty much just refreshing the dentin or the exposed tooth structure, ideally we want to be in mostly in, in enamel, which we do have in most of these preparations, but just really, really light, you can see with the carbide burr, carbide brown burr, and just lightly, lightly refresh and, and remove that excess bonding agent. Once that is removed, now we're going to try everything on. 
And so I always will use a try and pace. So aesthetic resin cements have a try and pace as well. The majority of time we're using translucent. Uh, there's also a lot of support for a mixture of translucent with white aesthetic cements to build and add value to these restorations. What you don't want is to try to shift the shade with those cements. You want to have a nice even preparation across the board. You don't want to rely on that restoration or even the cement to change the shade. So I use a micro brush to remove the excess. We check and evaluate once everything is confirmed. The patient confirms. Now we're going to seat and deliver these restorations. So I like to total etch. So we're going to apply an etching on all the preparations. Rather than flow the etch over the entire prep, I like to spread it out. I don't like to waste materials. So I just put a blob on each prep, use a brush, and just kind of distribute it down to the margins. Try not to get too much in the soft tissue. If they are abraded, it could cause some bleeding. But now you can see we just air, air remove the excess fluid. And that's normally our process, right? But through that removal of the excess fluids, we could potentially desiccate the teeth, leading to possible post-op sensitivity, right? So here I'm applying our desensitizing agent. This is our Gluma. Uh, there's a few other great ones on the market, uh, G5, Microprime. But we scrub that desensitizing agent in. That's going to help cause and precipitate proteins in the exposed tooth structure. And it's going to help rehydrate the tooth. It's going to help re-wet the tooth and improve the bond. And so once we apply that, be very careful, diligent with the application. And then we let that sit on for at least one to two minutes. And then you'll see we're going to take a suction and just go and run it through the incisal edges to aspirate the excess. We don't want to rinse this off. We leave it on. It almost serves as a primer as well. And then now we're going to apply our OptiBond Universal. I like a universal bonding agent. Uh, your bonding approach will vary, whatever works best in your hands. And so I want to get that through all of the margins. I typically sweep it along all the margins. And then any exposed tooth structure, especially exposed dentin, you want to scrub this in really, really well. Yes, dentin bonding is less predictable, but if we can infiltrate these resin monomers into the exposed dentinal tubules, that helps create our hybrid layer. That's the layer that we want to improve and strengthen the bond to uh, the tooth structure. Now, once the dentin bonding agent or the bonding agent is scrubbed into the preparations, we remove the excess. You can see we're aspirating the excess, I air thin it from the cervical region. You want to make sure that bonding agent's not too thick it's not pulled on the surface. The air thinning helps remove and evaporate the solvents. And then we do air, we do light cure the bonding agent. What that does is it helps suspend uh, the collagen fibers. It locks it into position. The bond strengths are higher once the bonding agent has been cured. But you don't want it too thick, otherwise that film thickness could affect uh, the final seat of your restorations. So once everything is cured, now we're going to load our restorations with our uh, resin cement. Again, it's a light cured resin cement. So this is, once again, Kerr's NX3. We use the translucent variety, or the translucent shade. And I normally don't like to overfill the restoration, so I'm real picky with the, even the excess that comes out. I don't like wasting the material, so we try to get a very, very thin layer of that material, and I just like to see a little bit flow out. It makes the cleanup much easier. But now you can see I'm using two seedings or bite sticks, one on the facial, applying pressure to the lingual, one on the incisal edge, slight pressure to the apical and lingual, and once this area gets cured in, notice how we're using that small light cure tip again setting the middle of each veneer. And this way you can sweep off the excess, wipe off the excess the way that you prefer. And so now we're going to check the bite. On those transitions at that lingual area, you want to smooth those transitions as best as possible using a fine grit diamond burr. I don't do this before it's bonded in. Once the restorations are set, you want a very, very smooth transition along all of those lingual margins that way the patient can't tell where the restorations begin or end. 
And then we go through all of our functional check centric and lateral excursions. We want to minimize any excessive forces through those lateral movements. And so this is the final. This is right after the, the delivery. And once again, this is a lithium silicate restoration. Still very, very strong, but your approach needs to be very important in the amount of reduction, providing enough space. We don't want these restorations to be too thin in areas of function. So yes, it's a more brittle material, but as long as you take care of the areas uh, in the preparation and bond these in and treat the materials properly, you can get an extremely great result with this as well. So you can see our patient before and after. And so in the design softwares, we were able to create the right contours and adapt and close those spaces the way that we needed to. I'm going to finish off with uh, a tip for you. I know that if you're not creating your own wax ups in the office, so this is a great case by Dr. Manuel, who you will hear from later. And you'll see, in order to get a nice result, this is a full mouth uh, fixed bridge, implant bridge. We want to establish the right midline, the right incisal edge shape. And if you spend any time with dentures, uh, you can see we normally define these parameters in the wax rim, right? Marking the midline. So we can follow a similar protocol for fixed cases as well. Creating this template for the lab, because if you just prepare teeth and send the prepared models to the lab, they're kind of guessing too where the incisal edge and midline should be. And the can't could very easily be off. And we now know how important we can't, can't, or leave can't on our patients, right? So incisal edge positions. So you can use composite, you can use acrylic, build it up, you can even use wax. And if you have a digital scanner, it makes it even easier. You can scan that little template that you make right at the centrals that defines the incisal edge position, midline, and the lab will be able to combine that with your preparations for the optimal results. Uh, thanks so much for your time.